All right. Morning. Morning. Guten Morgen. How have you been, Dylan? Uh, I've been pretty good. Good. Um, I've been just super busy with work. That's what I'm. Today's the last push to <clears throat> get the last of what I need to get done done. Good. And then so, what? Yeah, I'm happy. And then, uh, well, then I'll be done. Let's see. Can you guys still see me? Mm-hmm. There we go. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I've got other windows up on my computer. Um. Yeah, between my normal job and this, I do these surveys for Starbucks. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'll just do this later. Sorry. Um, yeah, I do these surveys for Starbucks. I'm doing a Petco one today, and it's just uh, they just sent me in with my 3D camera, and they like to use it for to have a record of of their stores and for redesign and measurements and just stuff like that. So I had to do 20 of them last week. Yeah. And they take about two hours each. So I'm trying to balance that between my normal photography stuff, real estate photography stuff, but got the last two done yesterday and I still have some stuff to put together before I submit it this morning. But yeah, almost done. And then, uh, yeah. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a good good night tonight when I'm just done. <laughs> I that would not be a good job for me. I'd walk in there and I'd be like, store layout looks great. Leave it as is. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm that guy that walks into the grocery store and sees them swapping sides and I'm like, what are you doing to my familiar space? <laughs> Morning, Sean. Good morning. never played around with this you can chat with people on here individually so if you're in a work meeting you can you could just talk crap about everybody uh. the individuals <laughs> <laughs> oh you mean in zoom yeah in zoom so i can i can chat yeah. sean individually it's not gossip if they're in the room <laughs> yeah but if i direct it only to somebody <clears throat> Well, that's just whispering. It's like. <clears throat> I should probably turn my light on. What are we doing today? 16 through 21? Uh, yes. Sean, you're, uh, you're muted or something. I was in chapter 16 in my, because I saw 16 through 21 and I was like, okay. that was in, in 17. Yeah. 17. 
it was chapter 16 through 21, we're going to be here a while. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, like at least noon, probably. Now discuss it. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> be here. Skip church. All right. Well, yes. Pray to get us started and um, probably take three passes at it again. Um, uh, dear Heavenly Father, um, thank you for this morning. Um, thank you for our rest last night and the ability to to wake this morning and get into your word and and spend some time in um, together with you, God. I just invite your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Well, I'll take a pass. Who else wants to take a pass? I can do it. Numero dos. Dylan. I'll do a third if we're going to do a third. Yeah, we'll do a third. Okay. All right. Damien, can you hear us? Si, senor. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, all right. Well, Paul was waiting for them in Athens. He was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Aeropagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Man, I just want to read more. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right. Now, well, Paul, can you guys hear me? Um, <clears throat> while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. So he, he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who chanced to be there. Uh, some also of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers met him. And some said, what would this babbler say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him to Aeropagus, Aeropagus, saying, may we know what is new teaching, may we know what this new teaching is what you present. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. 
now all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, What is this babbler saying? Others remarked, He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Well, what I was just writing down was just the fact that though Paul had to think in Dylan's translation, it said argue. And, um, Daniel and I, it said reason. Um, even though, like, I don't know, Paul must have been very convincing, it seems like, because they still had questions and they were still willing and wanting to understand you know, more about the story. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe in their culture, or I don't know what a, what a, uh, um, Epicurean and Stoic philosopher is, but, you know, maybe they were, they were open to it and whatever, whatever Paul was, preaching to them, you know, piqued their interest at least, and they didn't just reject it right at the beginning. So I thought that was curious. I was doing a little research on this, on these philosophical or religious beliefs and um, Epicureans as Stoics. Um, well, one, the, the, the Athens was like the center or the capital of like intellectual and cultural of the world, you know, the intellectual and cult, uh, cultural world at the time. It lost its political power, right, to Rome, but <clears throat> being, being in Greece, but um, uh, it was very much still all about, you know, philosophy and thought, different ways of thinking and culture and, and the Epicureans, um, they believed that um, there was a God, but it was distant and in, indifferent to human thought or to humans. Um, so they were, they were open to a lot of new ideas there. There was, a, it, and the Oropagus was a place where they would people could come and, and just talk and share their ideas, philosophical, or religious ideas. Um, but in the Oropagus, the uh, history of that place was that, you know, when, when Athens was the center of, of political power in the world, um, the Oropagus was like this, the council, the place where the council met, where all legal, legal matters, so legislation um, was enacted and um, they had they, it was like a court, so they had like civil cases and um, et cetera there. But it had become more of a forum for thought after it lost its political power. Funny thing, I'm looking up all of the famous Greek philosophers, and they're all 400, 500, 600 years before this. So this is like the tail end of all the Greek philosophy stuff yeah. in general. Sure. 
they say the only modern to this era modern philosopher that was of any note was this guy named Plutarch who lived from 45 to 120 80 would would he have been in the city in Athens at the time um I think that's around the time that um that would have been the time of this journey I don't know Paul's presence there because he was there from like 40 something to 50 something I think yeah 80 80 40 something or maybe 50 something to 60 something I actually my bible Second mar- yeah, second missionary journey was AD 49 to 52. Okay. That was during the time of Plutarch. Uh, Plutarch was 45, was born in 45. Oh, so he so was a little baby. Yeah. So Paul was talking to his parents. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess by the time Plutarch was growing up, there would have been some Christians in Athens. Right. Yeah, Yeah, this translation I've got is different from the other translations. Like I said, this is my aunt gave me this Catholic RSV Catholic edition. It's it's kind of it's it's kind of clunky to read sometimes, as you can tell when I'm reading. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it seems to use more like inflammatory. That might not be the right word, but more poignant language. You know, hmm. they argued instead of reasoned. And well, and that's. You know, it puts the image in my mind of, like, it also confuses me a little bit because I'm like, all I'm thinking is, how is this guy able to, like, as a foreigner, you're a foreigner and you come in and you tell everybody they're wrong (laughs) and you argue and, or or in your translation's reason, it it makes me wonder, you know, how he went about it. He, He must have gone about it in a pretty diplomatic way for them not to. For, for him to have survived this long. <laughs> you know, I don't imagine these these um, committed Jews, these, you know, these people are very committed to the longstanding tradition of their beliefs. It's, it's hard to imagine that he was accepted with, just, just accepted to the extent that he was, you know, even, even with his getting beaten and stoned and, you would think that uh, my perception is, man, I'm, I'm surprised that doesn't happen more often. <laughs> so he must have been a pretty charismatic dude, I guess. And obviously, he was smart. He's, he was, you know, he was. Um, <clears throat> people liken it to having a PhD in Old Testament. He studied under the best Pharisees at the time. He was very intelligent. Like he's cream of the crop. Um, I guess political and philosophical mind of the time. So maybe he garnered some respect for that. I mean, obviously he did, right? It's I mean, what yeah. what he did is pretty amazing. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. You can see, I, almost as you were talking about that, Dylan, I had the sense that, like, the faith of many of the Athenians, while they had these philosophical beliefs, right in. And, and religious beliefs, um, I get the sense that their their primary faith was faith in intellectualism. You know what I mean? Like that was the most important thing to them. And then secondarily, it's like, yes, I have a philosophy that I live by. You know, uh, you know, maybe a religion that I live by. But primarily, what I really value and respect is intellectualism. And like you said, Paul brought. Um, this, you know, intellectual capacity that was apparent. Um, And he was a teacher. He'd been teaching for years at this point, you know, everywhere he went. And so they're like, we want to know what this guy has to say. 
you know, we want to learn. They were, so they were, seems like they were really open-minded <laughs> and curious. It, part of me was kind of likening it to almost like when, you know, Christian mi missionaries today will go to, you know, these, these places like, like these very remote villages that aren't even living in the, you know, same century, you know, they, they still don't have technology and they're just so cut off from the rest of the world and they have their kind of traditions and their beliefs and, you know, from centuries ago and then they come you know they come in these missionaries come in and, and start start teaching them about god and and jesus and what he did and you know most of the time like i guess only when you hear about it you know they're they're pretty open to it i guess so it's Part of me feels like it's it's easier it's easier to convince that kind of people instead of like you know trying to convert you know a Jewish believer or something like that that it's like oh this goes against like everything they're using our Old Testament our Torah to explain something that kind of is against what we believe or something like that. I don't know. I hope that, hope that made sense, but. That's, that's funny when you were, when you were talking, I was, I was thinking of the, of the opposite point. Um, the way, the way it struck me, like when you compare, when you compare like a totally a, a culture and, and, and maybe a religion in these, you know, the, like modern day um, Christian missionaries will go to these small um, communities with, you know, the, culturally they're, they're totally separate from Judeo Christian Western influence. Right. In my mind, I was, I'm thinking it might be easier to convince you know, like Christianity is Christ is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. So to me, in, in some ways, it might be easier to convince people that are fluent in Old Testament philosophy that this this guy is actually the fulfillment of the Old Testament philosophy like this. It, I mean, I guess it's, it could go both ways. Right. Um, but my point is. It, I guess, I guess it depends on the group, but the the idea of going in and approaching someone that's totally all, these these concepts are totally foreign to them, and these like these African untouched tribes, for for example, right? If I'm putting myself in the position of someone in the tribe, I'm I'm going to be like, what are you talking about? This is insane. You're a crazy person. Whereas if I'm a if I'm a Jewish believer, I'm going to say, oh. Oh, this guy is actually making some sense. Let me, you know, in the chapter we read yesterday, they had to consult the the scriptures to see if they had been fulfilled. Like they actually did some research. So in my mind, I guess that's a that's a roundabout way of saying it, it might be easier in some ways to con to convince a Jew as opposed to someone that's totally, you know, all the, these ideas are totally foreign to them. But I could see it going the opposite way too. You know, yeah. the, oh, this, this is blasphemy. Yeah, it's, it, it's like it's like working with a, a clean slate instead of trying to. I guess it's not a completely clean slate, but in in the fact that it's, you know, completely new ideas to them and something that they had never even heard of before, even Old Testament stuff. Um, but it's like a clean slate. They're like, yeah, this guy, you know, it was prophesied about, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And now 
you know, here's, here's the culmination of that prophecy. And they're like, wow, that's really cool. You know, we believe that or, um, whereas it's like, okay, the prophecy says that, and, you know, somebody that knows the old Testament, they already have some influences and some ideas and, and thoughts that they've, and interpretations of that old Testament that they've kind of created in their minds and you're trying to flip it. It seems like it would be a little bit more challenging or you'd have more pushback. Yeah. Yeah. I can see it going both ways, but it's an interesting thought experiment. Uh It's, I find it, I find philosophy is kind of a confusing thing if you don't have any knowledge of the origins of whatever they're thinking. Like they talk about Epicureans and Stoics. I'm like, I know what Stoicism means today, but I don't, I did not realize this was some group of Greek guys that just thought a certain way. And what is their stance on everything? I don't know. What is the stance of an Epicurean? What is their, what is their, I don't know, their, um, their pitch? Oh, I know. I've been researching it. Ready? Um, okay. Epicureanism started in the 4th century BC. So, yeah, three, 300 years old at this point in time. Not super old. And their goal was happiness and tranquility. Avoiding pain and fear. Um, God exists, but it is diff- indifferent and distant. And there's no there's no afterlife for the Epicurean and Epicurean or judgment. The soul just dissolves kind of like the body does. The body dissolves, you know, um, after death, they felt like the soul did the same thing, but the Stoics were, were a little bit different. Um, they were also about happiness, but their, their key to happiness was accepting things as they are. So I kind of see that as like Zen kind of Buddhism, kind of philosophy. Um, also, they were always wanting, it, it felt like anger and envy and jealousy, those emotions were bad emotions, so they tried to avoid them. Um, they believed in a pantheistic God, that God pervades everything, um, that there was an afterlife, meaning that the soul did not dissolve um, upon death, but it was absorbed back into this divine force. So, <laughs> so it's kind of interesting, like when I read these things, I feel like our, there's a lot of, I think, religious culture in, in the United States that has adopted some a lot of these philosophies, it seems like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Avoiding pain, accepting things as they are. Um, maybe God being distant and indifferent. Um, right. Like I know one of the popular ones today is agnosticism. Mm-hmm. And how it compares with ancient Gnostics, I haven't looked too deep into it. But that's a that's a philosophy that goes way, way back too. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's something that I just had an experience yesterday at work talking to two of my coworkers. And they're they're more agnostic, I guess they would they would say. And one of one of my coworkers, he he grew up going to I think 
can't can't remember the name of the school now. And it's one of the like Christian schools in, in Denver. Um, and I think grew up going to like the Catholic church and stuff. But he, you know, he had all these like arguments and, and he's always saying like, yeah. And a lot of them are based out of, you know, stories based out of Genesis. But he's like, yeah, all, all major religions have a flood story and blah, blah, blah. So it's like he, he approaches the Bible as like just another, another kind of narrative that's based off of other religions' narratives too, but has its own spin on it and kind of approaches it more agnostically. And my my reasoning with him was like, yeah, that's, you know, the all in the Genesis account, but you know, what, what do you make of like, you know, the new, the new Testament and things like that. And, you know, he was still pretty agnostic to, you know, who Jesus is and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm sure you know, a lot of it stems from him being forced to like, you know, as a, a growing up being forced to like do these things that he didn't want to do of like reading and studying the Bible. And um, now he kind of is like indifferent to it. Interesting. I looked it up. Gnosticism is the idea or philosophy that something such as human or divine spirit, should and can be known. And they go into how it differs from the early church, early church's stance and how it's like, how it has direct opposition to some of actual church philosophy and church doctrine. Like, oh, there, there are multiple gods, there's not just one god, that kind of thing. This but it came out of Christianity? It did, in like 200 AD. Um, agnosticism is the idea that something such as a deity cannot or should not be known. Whoa. Yes, Yes, God exists, but we can't understand him. Let's just, <clears throat> he lives on a different plane than us, let's just let him live there. So maybe that's closer to the Epicurean, I believe. He's indifferent and distant. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess distant. He can't be known. But indifferent, maybe. I don't, an agnostic wouldn't necessarily claim that that's the case. So agnosticism is in direct opposition to Gnosticism. Uh, yeah, people, I mean, people today, that, that's, that's more coherent than, like, pe people, when they use the word agnostic today, it just means, I don't know. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm agnostic. I don't know. It could be, maybe, maybe not. And it's just kind of a. <laughs> yeah, kind to of me. A cop out. Yeah, to me, it's, it, yeah, it is. It's that cop out of like, you know, I, it's that cop out of saying like, I, you know, can't deny that there's a higher power, or, you know, <laughs> some, some higher power, but it's beyond what we can understand. So why even try? Mm -hmm. I believe um, there's a God, but I really don't care. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or care funny to you. know him or right. learn about him. Yeah. It's funny. Sean, your coworker was pretty much where I was at for the last couple of years. Mm. And you know, it is, it is true. And it's not just every religion, every culture, all these like major cultures from around the world with no communication, they all have a crazy flood story, flood myth. Mm -hmm. And then you get into, I've been super into Randall Carlson and uh, Graham Hancock and these guys, if you guys are familiar with them, they're big advocates of a, of a, of a major catastrophic flooding event that took place about 13,000 years ago and wiped out almost everyone on earth. <laughs> it was pretty good evidence for it. Um, but 
the the inerrancy of the of the Bible compared to everything else, I think is the wrong way to approach it. What what got me back into the faith was just the just the the Christian theology. Like it's it's true historically, it's true rationally and it makes sense like every everything that i think about everything i found was undergirded by some kind of judeo-christian ethic it came from the bible mm -hmm. i talked about eckhart toll the other day it's like one of these new age um he's really into zen and not, not really into zen but he he borrows a lot from like buddhism and for his philosophy of just being in the moment man and just being one with i'm like what does that mean <laughs> what is that and then and then you read uh new testament jesus says don't don't fret the, the birds birds from plants don't fret the lord provides seek seek ye the kingdom of god and all will follow uh tomorrow I'll worry about itself all, all those things are just like it, it comes from the bible it's just kind of it's all this new age yeah. Um, stuff that's ultimately just plagiarized, I guess, from the Bible. But um, going back to Sean's coworker, that I, I just I th I think it's I, I would say, hey man, like look look into if you're a truth seeker, if you're a person with any kind of philosophical mind, you, you'll you'll see that it's true. It, you just get, you know, it's you, you're. He's getting bogged down on, like, well, other religions say something similar. So, I mean, my my response is so, <laughs> like, I don't know. It's just it's deeper than the actual. It's. I mean, it's it's a weird thing to. It's a. I'm gonna have to. Maybe I'll sit down with you or like call you over the weekend have more time to talk about it but i i thought it was interesting because like that that's why i was like a year ago so sure i think that's that kind of stuff is really interesting nadine so. you were gonna say something oh sorry nadine i was stepped on you no you're fine when we were just talking about like the cop-out thing i think kind of similar to what sean has already said I think it's like easier to say I'm agnostic so that I don't have to say that I'm atheist and that I don't have to say I'm a believer. I'm just going to say I'm agnostic just because it's like in the middle ground. Yeah. And, and that was pretty often. Yeah. That was one of my, my two coworkers. Both of them were like, yeah, we don't want to say we're atheist. So we don't want to, say we're a Christian or a believer, so they, yeah, found the middle ground of agnosticism. Yeah, because right. if you take a stance, you, then you put yourself in a position of potentially having to defend that stance. Right. Yeah. That's the way I was I, um, before I became a believer when I was 20. I would call myself probably, I would have called myself agnostic. And I, and I do remember, you know, I, I didn't like confrontation, and I never wanted to be in a position where I had to, defend my stance and so i was like i don't know <laughs> you know yeah yeah that's what it means a, is, yeah. yeah yeah <laughs> it sounds like it used to mean something a little bit more structured mm -hmm. well, yeah well and to me too it's like it's taking that stance of like eh, i don't know it's almost like a cop out too to say I don't want to put in the effort yes. yeah, to, to find out more or something or, right. or like, I guess like Damien was saying, like to, to make a case for the stance that you're making. Right. Yeah. So I think that like, the, like Dylan, what you're talking about, like the term, you know, sometimes we'll use the, the word agnostic to mean, I just don't know. So we're, we're not taking a stance. But as Daniel read the definition, it's a little bit different in that it actually means that you believe there is a God, but that God is just so beyond us, there's no way for us to really understand him. 
right? By definition, that what is that is what agnosticism is. It um, so I wouldn't have called myself an agnostic, really. I mean, based on that definition, mm -hmm. prior to being a believer. Um, and that's interesting. That's actually like that's a that's a that's incoherent. The the old the old definition or the agnostic there is a god but you can't we we cannot possibly understand um, if God has a will we we're not capable of understanding that will we're not capable of understanding um, God's mind it, that's that's the exact same thing as saying there is no God <laughs> totally irrelevant like well if I can't understand him then he's not God isn't a factor in my life that's achieving that's achieving the exact same thing, practically speaking, as not believing in God. It's that's in, that, to me is it just incoherent right off the top. Yeah. Whereas me in my twenties, I would have called myself a Christian, but I also don't like confrontation, so I just never told anybody my stance <laughs> because I did not want to have to, like everybody's mentioning, I wouldn't have, I didn't want to have to defend it because I really didn't do my research. I mean, even now I anything any bit of inspiration I get just kind of pops into my head as okay, this is a verse I remember hearing at some point quick research it uh where is it where is it where is it? Thank God the Bible app exists and it has a search function. Yeah. But that was that was me too, you know, growing up going to going to church and and things like that and like, oh, my parents are Christian, so I guess I'm a Christian and didn't quite, you know, understand the full scope of it, of, you know, being in a relationship hmm. with with God or with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and all that. And, and like, but if somebody, you know, similar to Daniel, if somebody were to confront me about it or I, you know, was to confront somebody else about it and kind of be more evangelical. I was like, Oh, I'm not, I'm not capable of doing that. I don't know enough. I need to research this more and figure out how to argue, argue the case. But yeah. Yeah. And I've heard that argument. Was it you Dylan that mentioned this, that like no one was one to the faith through debate and argument. Yeah. I mean, from personal experience, that it's a really complicated thing, man. Um, but no one, no one was going to convince me by telling me the Bible is true because the Bible says it's true. That's a, that's an appeal to authority, right? Logical fact. That's that's always how I thought. But yeah, what. What got me was people that I really, really respect intellectual minds. Every single one of them had great affinity for, for Christendom. Hmm. That's, that's what ultimately got me. I'm like, okay, well, I need to look more deeply into this. Whereas other people I, I just heard, I just heard a guy on a podcast yesterday talking about, he made the exact opposite point. He said, all, all of my favorite philosophers, like Sam, like, hey, yeah, I, I apologize for calling Sam Harris a philosopher, <laughs> but uh, that, that was the point he made. Sam Harris and um, a couple of other people, he said, oh, all, all those people that I really respect, it, uh, I, um, I think that are atheists, so I'm, therefore I'm an atheist. So he was making the opposite point, but to me, those people are just completely full of themselves. I don't... <laughs> Well, there, you know. I think there's still something to say about that too. It's like if somebody has influence over you, and they, you know, they're a Christian or you know whatever, you you're gonna have that influence playing that part in influencing your beliefs, your ideals, your philosophies, you know, whatever. So I still think you know there's. And, and I think that's that's kind of like this movement, even within the Christian realm, is like, you know, as like a father or a leader or whatever. It's like you have influence over your children, 
so, you know, what do you want to influence them in? Right. I mean, you take, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. I mean, you take, um, like the modern, modern denomination, denominations of Christianity. And you've got, like, I looked up who is, who's in, who, who started the reformed movement. So reformed Christians follow the teachings of Martin Luther and you've got Calvinists that follow John Calvin. And I looked up, who's the start of the, the Baptist movement, Jesus. I'm like, nah, somebody came up with a good <laughs> Jesus. John the Baptist. That's hilarious. But somebody in America created the Baptist movement. And I heard a reformed guy on YouTube say that, yeah, technically non-denominational charismatic Christians are deep down also just Baptists mm -hmm. in their, in their, at their root. And I'm like, interesting. Okay. That makes sense. But it's like, yes, we still all follow some human made philosophy in the modern church. And I'm thinking, okay, when does it change from following a human philosophy based in Christianity to actually experiencing the spirit of God affecting you directly. And that's where I need to keep thinking. Cause you know. ask that question again. When does, cause we're like, when we are in, a church, we follow some human made philosophy that is based in Christianity. And I guess in our case here, we follow a human based philosophy that is heavily based in Christianity and is Christianity as like a definition. When does that turn? When does that change into something like? the actual spirit of God coming down and affecting you personally. Mm. Yeah, maybe. So it's like the difference between having a relationship with the belief system mm -hmm. versus having a relationship with the living God right. that established that belief system. Exactly. Yeah, and I, I think that's kind of my experience. You know, I was influenced by traditionally Christian Christian beliefs and a Christian household and, you know, a non, -de a non denominational church, but it wasn't until I had that experience of, you know, the Holy spirit coming down on me. And, but I think you need to have that foundation of that influence and that, that Christian philosophy to understand what that Holy spirit is and acknowledging, Hey, this is the Holy spirit. This is God speaking to me coming into my life and that's when you know you make that connection between the head and the heart and the, or the head and the soul and and then it transforms you i also think it's similar to like catholicism we have the belief in the system and in like the religion itself you know it almost, to me, growing up in a Catholic church, it just always felt like a routine. Went to church when you were, like, doing your, um, you're baptized as a baby, then you're, you know, when you're old enough, you start doing your Holy Communion. You're going to Sunday school to learn, and then, you know, you start your confirmation. Again, back to Sunday school to continue to learn. And you almost didn't have that intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship with you know, the Holy Spirit one-on-one, -on -one, like a personal relationship. It was just the relationship with, yeah, with the religion and system itself. So it was just very impersonal. Yeah. That's interesting. But I don't, I don't know where now as a Christian, where, where that, like you said, Daniel, I don't know where that essentially the switch light switch finally switches up or switches on. It's funny that you, that you bring up, you know, the routine of, you know, Catholicism and 
That's something that I wrote down after the first reading this morning was kind of my feelings on on just this first fruits experience. I'm like, man, I, I'm I'm feeling like in the last like week, week and a half, I felt like this has been more of that routine that I haven't really had that personal personal like you know, hearing from God or something. And it's, you know, cause Acts has been lately kind of more historical and us kind of digging into the culture and stuff and the time period and the different regions and things like that. And I'm like, it's, it seems for me, it's been less applicable and emotional. I kind of just prayed about it. I'm like, God, just, just speak to me in some way um, to, to tug, to tug and speak more to my emotions or, or what I, you know, what I could be doing or learning from these stories of Paul. And it was, it was weird that that just kind of came up and then that's kind of what we ended up talking about too, but. Um, you say, here I am. No. Dr. Steve. I realized my Google search was wrong. I said, who is the start of baptism? And that was Jesus. Who is the start of the Baptist church? It says American Baptists look to Roger Williams from 1683. Mm. And John Smith led the first Baptist church in Amsterdam in 1609. I like Jesus better. Yeah, me too. That was a way funnier answer. Right. <laughs> who founded your church? Jesus. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> I think this thing is about to kick us off, isn't it? Oh, it's a pro account. Oh, nice. We're pros. Yeah, we did go pretty long today, so I guess we'll, we'll wrap up here. Unless anybody had something itching they wanted to get off their chest or say. I think there's just, there's one word that I was hearing, you know, the contrast of, you know, religion versus relationship. And it was like the main difference is that there's this, with the relationship piece, it's, there's an encounter with the living God that transforms us. That's the, in my heart, that's the biggest, that's the main difference. So, just my last, last thought. Okay. Um. Well, yeah, let me let me pray to close this out. This is this has been good for me. I mean, I like I said, I was struggling with with really having that encounter lately in the word. Um, but I think God's just been speaking speaking to me through it and and just kind of encouraging me. It's like I was I was like I can't wait to get to Romans because there's a lot of really good, you know, sp spiritual and, and, and applicable and, you know, kind of self-reflection in that. And I haven't been feeling that self-reflection in these stories with Paul, but I think it, I think it hit me. Um, so, but yeah, let me, let me pray and, we can start our start our days. Um, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. I thank you for everyone involved today and everyone here, um, and the and the time that that we get to spend in your Word. Um, 
even though sometimes it feels like a routine or a or something that you know we just have have come to come to do um, every morning. I just I just ask that you speak to us and that that we would feel your presence throughout the day and and that we would have a true encounter with your spirit and feel your presence and that that we would know our influence um, over others and that we would not be afraid to share that that encounter that we have with you and, and still relate relate it back to your word and that you would give us the words to speak to others and to influence them and encourage them to be sensitive and aware of of you God and we know and understand that you transcend all time and space and knowledge and understanding um, but we want to know you God we want to have that encounter with you and just help us foster that encounter um, in other people. I just pray that your spirit be with us and, and guide us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Right. Love you guys. Love you. Love you. See ya. We'll see you later. See you guys. Bye. Have a good one.